Yeah. Right. So we have seen categories and we were in the process of giving examples. So we gave this toy example. Which we, we just had... drew a picture and then turned the picture into the... Yeah. And uh, nailed down. Connor showed us the category of sets where the objects are sets and the homomorphisms are functions. We talked about function extensionality, which says that two functions are equal if they agree on every input. And then we were saying we wanted to talk about the category of monoids, where the idea is that we take, uh, we want to have a category where the objects are monoids, because we, we like to categorize things like this. Right? And the idea is that, okay, so we know what the objects are, but we have to come up with a sensible notion of morphism between monoids. And there is not one answer that's obviously the best answer, right? Because if we look at the definition of category, then we have to say, okay, what is a morphism between, in this case, two monoids? If we say the objects are monoids, there needs to be an identity and there needs to be a composition, and it has to set satisfy these laws, but there's not a unique way to do this, right? So for example, I could always say that as soon as I have my objects to be sets with some structure, I can always take my morphisms to just be functions between the sets. Forget about the structure, right? Because I know that functions have an identity, functions compose, and it does it in an associative way and such that the identity is the identity, right? Um, so that's always an option, but it's often not a good option because it doesn't really reflect the structure that I wanted to build into my category. Right? Um, and I'll see that when I later do constructions on my category, it's not going to be well behaved and, and play nicely. Um, but it means that there is a choice. And the right answer is often that you want your morphisms to really respect the structure you put on the objects. So in this case, our objects are monoids. So now we want the functions that preserve the monoid structure, right? So a monoid was given by a multiplication and a unit. So we want the morphisms to be the functions that preserve the unit and preserves the multiplication, whatever that means, right? Um, so that's what I'm trying, I'm starting to say here in this record. I'm saying, what is a monoid morphism from A to B? Uh, it's a function from the carrier of A to the carrier of B that preserves the unit. So I'm saying that if I apply the function to the unit in A, then I get the unit in B. And it preserves the multiplication in the sense that if I apply the function to x times y, then I get the same thing as if I first apply the function to x and first apply the function to y, and then I multiply it in B, right? So I can either multiply and then translate, or I can translate and then multiply. And I get the same result. Um, so it's not obvious that this is the right answer, but I'm, I'm kind of just following my intuition and saying, okay, I want to preserve all the extra structure I have here, right? So you could say a monoid also has these laws. Do you need to preserve the laws? Um, but there's going to be at most one proof of these laws anyway, so there's nothing to really preserve, right? Yeah. And uh, I really want to draw pictures, but I know you don't want me to draw pictures. Well, that's <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so the thing about these things is that you can imagine, imagine the picture, right, uh, of um, uh, a tree of doing addings up, uh, where you feed some numbers in at the top, and then uh, every time two branches join, you add them up. So you, you get the total out the bottom. So this is a picture that tells a story at each node. There's a truth about adding at each node in the picture. And what we want from a morphism of monoids is that if you apply the function to the whole picture, transforming the data uh, into some other values and the operations into the operations of a of another monoid that the picture stays true so it's not just that it takes values in a to values in b but it takes the whole all the truths about the operations in the a monoid and turns them into just as true things about the b monoid it's also good to think these are particularly well-behaved functions. 
So there are rather fewer of them than there are badly behaved functions. So, so it's good if you've got, if, if someone's saying, actually, this thing has to, uh, this has to be sensible in some way, it rules out a lot of silliness, um, as we'll probably see in a bit. Yeah. Um, OK, but if we say these are the morphisms I want to consider, then we now have some proof obligations, right, in the sense that we need to show that the identity function has, well, there has to be some kind of identity, and probably the function we're going to choose to be the identity function, but that means we have to show that it preserves these things. And similarly, we have to show that we, there is some way to combine these things, to compose them, yeah. which we're probably going to do by composing the underlying functions, yes. but then we have to show that these really yeah. preserve these things. Well, I mean, the identity function is pretty good at preserving things on yeah. the whole. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so because we are needing to show that these kind of things are, e are equal, I've just factored out a kind of technical lemma that says that to show that f is equal to g, it's enough to show that the underlying functions are equal. So we don't need to worry about the, yeah, the proofs the of proofs the extra laws. Being just are they the same function? Yeah. Um, so so I don't expect you to, to look at this too much. But uh, uh, okay. let's see if we can define the category. Right. Um, do you want to do this? Um, all right. If I can figure out how that's done. All right, let's see. We're going to have to give lots of bits and pieces. OK, so the objects are monoid. That's how it's spelt. And then somewhere, the name of which I've forgotten, at monoid morphism. Nip monoid morphism. Okay. So I'm being asked to give a monoid morphism from A to A. So there's going to be the easy bit and the hard bit. Again, I can use co-patterns to be to split that into the three things I have to produce. So here, I've got to give a function from the carrier of A to the carrier of A. And unremarkably, I'm going to choose lambda A goes to A, the identity function. OK. And now I have to prove that if I do the identity function to the unit of A, I get the unit of A. Uh, let's not faint with amazement that that's easy. Uh, likewise, uh, if I do the identity function to two things before combining them, that should give me the same thing as combining them and then doing the identity function. Because doing the identity function does nothing. We've got absolute classic nightmare Agda module system, whoops, the module argument has become the first argument of composition and <laughs> uh, of the multiplication, rather. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, bullet applied to A, then X, then Y, <laughs> because it's a projection from a record. Uh, so yeah, that's that often becomes slightly unreadable. But here, this is somebody gives me an x and a y. Um, is this where I actually say it's a bit tricky, especially as the a is implicit? Anyway, it's a trivial proof obligation. Okay, so there we go. Uh, we've defined. We've shown without any great difficulty that the identity function preserves uh, monoid structure. Now let's go with composition. So somebody gives me an F and a G and an element of A. Uh, not uh, quite. Not you quite. Have to. Oh, yeah, I've got to do the thing. Yeah. Yes. OK, because I'm being asked for a, a monoid morphism. OK, so again, I better do my split. 
Do we have a composition operator knocking around? Uh, no, we didn't define it. Well, well, I guess I can do it. OK, so somebody, so yeah, for the function part, I have to give a function from the carrier of A to the carrier of C. But, you know, I've got a pretty good idea how I'm going to get my hands on one of those things. Someone's going to give me an A. And I, I need to get to C. Uh, I've got fun f. What does that do? That gets me from carrier of A to carrier of B. So I can do that to my A to get something in the carrier of B. And then I can do fun G to get me the rest of the way. So it's exactly monoid morphisms are functions that are well behaved. So we can compose them and then we have to check that they stay well behaved. Right. So does, it pres does composition preserve the identity? Well, here I need to think a little bit um, about how to do that. Do we have nice kind of equational reasoning? You might not like it, but we, do we have the standard library ones, yeah? Uh, I can't type it. <laughs> um, OK, so because uh, I'd rather use that style. Yeah. Uh, but I can't type it, well, so I, you can, I, I yeah, can maybe it. you should. Uh, uh, right. So I think we have yes. it. So we say begin something. Yeah. It's one of these things where I could sit here saying rewrite by this, rewrite by that. But then, uh, then the trouble is that the explanation only shows up transiently in the information buffer, where it would be nicer to write something that reads like proof that lives in your code that you, know, that you can make sense of once it's finished instead of only while you're doing it. You know, <laughs> so that's what we want to write this down. OK, so um, yes. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just called A, isn't it? Oh, but it's here. It's Yes, you're going to need to get your hands on a bunch of stuff. Um, Let's see. A, B, C. Right, we've got some things in scope. That's, yeah, OK, good. Right. OK, you can tell me what to do. OK, well, um, what do we know about uh, what happens when we feed F, the identity in A. What, does F, what has F promised us? It's a monoid morphism from A to B. So if we feed it the identity of A, we should get the identity of B. So that gets us somewhere. We should be able to do a Kong step on that to get us to the identity in B, and uh, yeah, so you'll need Hong Fun G of preserves epsilon F, preserves identity F. And now uh, we've got as far as the identity on B, we are hoping that we're going to get the rest of the way to the identity on C by using the fact that G is the monoid morphism. Okay, so good. fine. So far, uh, what happens next? Somebody gives us uh, an X and a Y. Uh, and we're going to, but you can see what's going to happen. It's the same shit, different day. Uh, we are going to bubble F through the A multiplication to get a B multiplication. So we always just pick some random monoid that we're imagining and use that word for the binary operator. Uh, so um, we've, because we've written a bullet that looks a bit like multiplication, we're calling it multiplication. But the trouble is that uh, <laughs> It's a good metaphor if the monoid you're working with actually is multiplication, but it's a bit of a pain if it's adding <laughs> or function composition or any of those other things. <laughs> you know. So anyhow, 
um, uh, we've got um, uh, so what, what I've done here is just to be able to read the goal I have yes. opened these monoids so that we are writing the bullet yeah I think you should probably do B while you're about it uh, yeah I, I fear it's not going to work when I if I actually want to do this again Reasoning. And I don't solve this. The problem is that it's fine for displaying the goal, but now when I write it myself, it's not clear what if this means the one in A or the one in C. Right. But are you allowed to write A dot? So um, bullet it infix like that. That's at least something. Um, Right, so I think what I should do is I should say module yes. A. Um, and then you're, if you've actually named the module, you're allowed to write a.bullet. And then same deal there. And you can tell you're going to want B while you're about it. So it's a bit annoying with the whole module thing, but. Yeah. Uh, this is in Let's C. see. Yeah. Okay. And you can bet what's going to happen in the middle. We can push F through the A multiplication to get a B multiplication. And then we can push G through the B multiplication to get a C multiplication. So you see, here we've got two funds on the outside. Here we've got two funds on the inside, and in the middle we need one on the inside, one on the outside. Right, so the first thing is... Kong fun G. Fun G. With the, whatever it was from F. Yes. Is that... Oh. Actually... Oh yeah, that is the right thing. And then this is... Right. Cool. So here, this should really be fun effort. Yes. Yes, a good job to do that with Control C, Control S. Yeah. It, 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 that. Uh, it, it's not. It, it's kind of good that I to configure it out, but we still want to see the explanation. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So now. Uh, the next thing we've actually got to do is to prove that our notion of um, uh, identity and composition uh, are appropriately uh, associative. So the, the composition absorbs the identity and is associative. But hang on a minute. We basically just said, it's the identity function and function composition that we're doing here. And we noticed that that was how it worked uh, when we built the category of set. Yeah. So the fact that Fred has got the handy thing, which says um, that monoid morphisms are equal when their underlying functions are equal. So that's to say, you don't have to worry about the proof of preserving identity matching up. Or yeah, the proof parts are, are have no bearing on whether the things are equal. Yeah. So, um, so we, once you say, we went uh, we went from here, right, where we had to yes, prove two, two monomorphisms being equal, composite that this way and composite that way. You can say, okay, it's enough to show that the underlying functions are equal. So let's use that lemma. At which point, all right, and then we look at what the goal is, composition. and we see function composition was on the nodes. lovely and associative. So Raphael just works here, right? So. We strongly suspect the same thing is going to happen. Right, because again, we want an equality between monoid morphisms. OK, we can always say, let's just look at the underlying things. Let's see what's left. And we see that it's another instance of eta equality, right? F yes. is the same as lambda A, F of A. Yeah. 
So the way Agda compares functions for equality is that it, it, it makes up a variable of the input type and sees what happens if you feed that variable to both functions. And if you get the same thing coming out, then they're equal. So uh, correspondingly, lambda a, f of a, if you feed it a variable, gives you f of that variable. And if you feed f itself, that variable, you get f of the variable. <laughs> so it's... Uh, uh, so it looks a little bit like this postulate of function extensionality, right? The difference is that here, we are allowed to pattern match on, on this in order to determine this equality. Yes, it's but allowed to be true on a case-by-case -case basis, as opposed to doing one experiment, feeding a completely inert variable to the function. Okay, so that was one example of a category which was not set, which was set yes. with some extra structure, namely the structure of being a monoid. Right. Yeah, it might be, we have a moment to think a little while about um, uh, about monoid morphisms. Yeah, if you want. Um, so, um, and the, my puzzles from last time included, uh, what, how many, um, well, can you think of a function uh, from Nat to Boole, which gives, now you can see we're actually looking for a monoid morphism from uh, the, um, from the additive natural numbers uh, to the uh, monoid on the booleans given by and and true. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so um, we've got no choice about where to send zero. That has to map to true. So of course, uh, we could also send all the other numbers to true, and then we'd have a very boring function that always returns true. But it would certainly be a monoid homomorphism. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, where would be the fun in that? Uh, yes, so uh, you can always make a monoid, mo uh, uh, monoid homomorphism just by collapsing, right? Just by saying, okay, always return the identity of the target monoid. <laughs> you know, that'll preserve identity and it will commute very boringly with the multiplication. However, here, there's a much more exciting thing we can yeah. do. Just if you want to do that, and I would recommend not pattern matching here. Yes, because <laughs> quite. Makes the proofs harder. Makes the proofs. Yes. <laughs> because now it's not obvious if this is zero or successor, right? That's... So. But that's not the one we want anyway. So yeah. So, uh, uh, so what do we need? Uh, well, there's only one thing that works. Okay. So here's the thought about monoid homomorphisms from the uh, the adi upi numbers uh, are completely determined by where they send one. Because two is one plus one, and corresponding whatever the morphism does to one plus one, it has to be it has to give you morphism of one combined with morphism of one. Right? That's the point is that the the monoid morphism laws give you only one degree of freedom choosing a monoid morphism from the additive numbers. You've got no choice about where to send zero because you have to send it to the identity of the target monoid. And once you've decided where one goes, you've decided what happens to everything. So here, we, just, we, we started out boringly sending one to true. Um, uh, so let's see what happens if we send one to false. If we send one to false, we have to send two to false. Because uh, you know, the image of one plus one has to be false and false, which is false. And correspondingly, we have to send three to false because three is one plus two. So the, um, the image of one plus two has to be the image of one and the image of two. And so they're both false. 
<laughs> the whole thing's false, so it keeps, keeps going. Uh, so, in fact, all of the successors are going to be false. So, the, the test for being zero is the monoid morphism, uh, the, the non-trivial monoid morphism from the additive numbers to the conjunctive booleans. Okay, so if we want yes. to show that we're really preserving sending plus to and, right? yeah. then we have to ask, why is it stuck? Right. And why is it stuck? Well, this thing is defined by pattern matching on X, so we better do that. Yeah. And this thing is defined by pattern matching on its first argument, so we might yeah. be in luck again. Yeah. So what we're saying here, of course, is that if you're adding up two numbers and you want the total to be zero, the only way you can get zero out of adding up is to put both zeros in. Right. Once, once, you're, once either number is non-zero, uh, the total is non-zero. So, <laughs> uh, so there you go. Um, so then I asked the question, uh, how many monoids are there on the Booleans anyway? Um, we've found one, uh, uh, and and true. Uh, can you think of any more? I mean, which operations? Or, or with false, yes. Uh, so we're up to, to two. Um, okay, so here's the deal. You've got, when you're constructing a monoid on the Booleans, you've got to choose which of the two Booleans is going to be the unit element of your monoid. And if you think about it, that actually determines three lines of the truth table. Because you decide, uh, you decide that maybe zero is going to be your unit element, then you've got to decide what the operation does. And if you feed in 0, 0, the monoid laws tell you it has to be 0. If you feed in 0, 1, the monoid laws tell you that has to be, because 0 is the unit element, it has to be 1. If you feed in 1, 0, <laughs> again, the monoid laws tell you that has to be 1. So the only choice you have left is what happens if you put two 1s in? What happens if you put in, if both inputs are not the unit element? And there you've got two choices. So that tells you that there are only going to be four monoids on the booleans. And they are given to you, by, or at least there are at most four. Actually, they all check out. They are all monoids. And they are uh, and with true or with false, XOR with false, and equality with true. And that's your lot. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there can't be uh, any others. And the, uh, so once upon a time, someone may have taught you De Morgan's laws, which are actually telling you that the Boolean not operator is a monoid homomorphism uh, from the and and true uh, monoid to the uh, or and false monoid, and vice versa. So you, you know, that, that law that says not of A and B is not A or not B, that's a monoid homomorphism condition. Pure and simple. There was only one idea, you know, and it comes along with the fact that not true is false. That's the other the other condition for being a monoid morphism. Uh, so uh, these days, when I teach CS one hundred six and De Morgan's laws, I do say monoid homomorphism. So you got off lightly. Uh, <laughs> we only waited till fourth year to tell you that actually. There was only one idea, and it comes up over and over again. Um, okay, let's look at one more example of a category, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
So it's another example of taking a set and adding some extra structure to it. Um, and this time, the extra structure we're considering is having an order relation on the set. So I'm saying that a pre-order is a carrier set together with an order relation, and it has to set satisfy certain laws again. So I want it to be reflexive. So x is always less than or equal to no. x. Do, do yeah. these things remind you of anything? The reflexivity condition and the transitivity condition? Have you seen anything like that in this file? And then this thing basically says, you don't have to worry about the order, the, say the associativity or anything, because there are no bits in the data. You know, so the equations hold anyway, whether you think about them or not. Um, uh, so basically, pre-order is boring category. Because <laughs> reflexivity says I can get from x to x, that's the identity. Transitivity says if I can get from x to y and from y to z, then I can get from x to z. It's like composition, right? And propositional or this is usually called, we call it irrelevant nowadays, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, that was a bad move. Yeah. Um, right. So it says that actually, if I have any two proofs that x is less than y, then they are the same. Right? So there's no interesting information in the proof. It's just the fact that there is a proof. Right? Um, so it's again, it's a set with some extra data, right, the order. So then you can say, okay, what should be the, the right notion of morphism between these things? And again, we want it to be a function that preserves the extra structure, right? Which in this case means that it's a monotone map, so it respects the order. So it's a function from the carrier of P to the carrier of Q, such that if X is less than Y, then the function applied to x is less than the function applied to y, right? So we are preserving the order relation. And then again, we have this little lemma which says that two such functions are equal if the underlying functions are equal. So we don't need to worry about this monotonicity proof. Um, and let's see if we can make a category. So, as usual, we have to say what are the objects, what are the morphisms, is there an identity, is there a composition, and does it satisfy these laws, right? So I want my objects to be pre-orders. And I have to say, given two pre-orders, what is the set of morphisms between them? Well, these are the monotone maps. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it really is the same story for these kinds of stuff with structure. I mean, sets with structure is that the morphisms are always going to be functions on the underlying set, and then we just have to check that they don't mess up. Yeah. Okay, so, so I have to say, what is the identity? Well, it has to be a function which doesn't mess up. So the underlying function needs to go from the carrier A to the carrier A. That's lambda A goes to A again. And I have to check, is this function monotone? Well, if I normalize what that means, it means that if x is less than y, then id of x has to be less than id of y. Which is very easy yeah, to prove. Nothing, right. Nothing's moved. <laughs> uh, so that's the same proof P. I have to give a composition. So I have to, oh, okay. Composing F and G. I have to say, what is the underlying function if I compose F and G? So this again has to be from the carrier A to the carrier of C. So I get an A. I have to make a C. While the underlying function of G will get me a C if only I give it a B. And the underlying function of F will get me a B if I give it an A, but I have an A. So again, I'm just composing the underlying functions just like we did before, right? And now I have to show that this is monotone. So X, Y, and the proof P that X is less than Y. Okay, and now in C, I have to show that fun G of fun F of X is less than fun G of fun f of y, but I know that g is monotone, so that will get you. I have g of something less than g of something else, right? So if I give this fun f of x, fun f 
a Y. If only I can fill in this hole, then I get what I want. And okay. here I need to show that f of x is less than f of y, but I know that f is monotone. So if only I can fill in this hole, I get what I want. But this is the assumption that x is less than y. So in a way, the monotonicity proof here is like the identity, right? P goes to P. And the monotonicity proof here for the composition is like the composition of the monotonicity proofs, right? So <laughs> it's the same thing happening one level up in some sense. Yes. Okay. And then again, we have to show that this is associative. So we need to show that this monotone map is equal to this monotone map. Well, but yeah, it boils down to is uh, composition on the underlying functions associative. And yes, function composition is associative. <laughs> It's the same story again. It's enough to look at the underlying thing, but there it's easy because it's in set. Things are nice and easy. So. Okay. Cool. Uh, so we've seen two different examples of adding some structure to sets, and this is a typical way that we make categories, right? We have some structure we care about, um, so we may turn it into a category so that we can can keep it in one place and do constructions on it. But, uh, there's also some other ways you can make kind of edge cases of categories. Uh, so for example, yeah. every set can be seen as a category. Um, how yeah. does this work? Do you want to do this, Laura? Uh, yeah, this is uh, another. Um, let's, you're not going to faint with amazement. At least I hope not. Um, Right, so, um, so the objects of the discrete category on a given set X are just the elements of the set X. Uh, and the, uh, the thing that we do here, so, so I have to say what the homomorphisms are, there's something that goes from X to X to set. And I have to make sure that at least the identity morphisms exist. So what I do is I say that the homomorphisms here are given by the equations between the elements. So there's only a morphism from an element to another element if they're the same element. Okay? So then here, what am I asked for? I'm asked for a proof that A equals A, that's refl. And then here, I'm asked for equality to be transitive. Is that even a thing? Is that a thing? Uh, yes. Um, and then what happens? I have to prove that these things are um, uh, are equal. But I thought I spotted. Um, uh, well, okay. So here, uh, I kind of want to get my hands on F, G, and H. I think because they're equations. So I type them in and ask Agda to manifest them, and. Here, if I even, I think if I pattern match on F, is that enough? Good, looks good to me. And then what happens here? Um, I need to prove that F is F. This one might be uh, fiddlier. But pattern matching on F. Will get me there. Uh, Okay, so that's another boring kind of category, which basically says all the structures in the objects, there's nothing interesting happening in the morphisms. The morphisms are exactly the equations. Okay, uh, do you want to do the... Sure. Yep. the so we could also try to do we've had the other extreme, right? So the, here we said the objects are interesting, but the morphisms are not. We could also consider to just put information in the morphisms and not in the objects. Um, 
But I, I can't I have to be a little bit careful because if I say that there are no objects, then there can also be no morphisms, right? Because morphisms are between the objects. So the the simplest thing I can say is that there is, is exactly one object. And then I can talk about morphisms from that object to itself, right? And the claim here is that if you have a monoid, then that's exactly the same thing as such a category with one object, right? And yes. Let's see how that plays out. So, so uh, um, given a monoid, I have to make a category. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, you can think of a one object category as just uh, hopping on the spot. Uh, and you can, like, for natural numbers additively, you can hop no times on the spot for, you know, one, two, you know what? <laughs> Um, so I'm saying there is only one object, and the morphisms are going to be given between TT and TT. That's the only thing that lives in here, right? Uh, the morphisms are going to be given by the elements in the carrier of M. So yeah. that's a set. Okay. So what do the requirements reduce to? Right, so I need to have an identity, which uh, for every A in the unit type, uh, I should have an element in the carrier of M. Uh, but I know that I always have a unit in the monoid, epsilon M, right, which lives in the carrier. And for the composition, if I have M and N, which lives in the carrier, then I have to produce one more thing in the carrier. But I know I can actually multiply my elements in my monoid, right? So, uh, right. So that takes two elements of the carrier, M and N, and gives me another one. Uh, and then the conditions for being a category degenerate very pleasingly to exactly the conditions for being a monoid. So what did we call this? We called it a sock. Okay. It's the same names for the identities as well. So we see that associativity of composition, when composition is defined to be multiplication, is associativity of multiplication. The fact that the unit is the unit uh, is the same thing as this morphism being the identity when, when these are the morphisms and so on. Right? So one way to see a category is as a typed monoid. Right? The monoid, you can always multiply any two things. That's what this type says. As soon as you have any two things in the carrier, you get another one in the carrier. In a category, if you have two things that match up in the middle, then you can multiply them together, compose them, right? So it's, it's a refined notion of a monoid in that sense. Whereas a monoid is a category, a special case where you only have one object, in which case things will always match up in the middle, right? If there's only one thing. So that's another kind of degenerate category, which is not very interesting in its own because there's only one object. But it's, it's good to see that you have these special cases. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think we'll just leave the pre-orders in the lecture notes if you, so, if you want to look at Yes. Those. I mean, you might have noticed the conditions on pre-orders being that they're reflexive and transitive. And think identity and composition. Uh, you know, it turns out that... Um, uh, uh, the pre-orders uh, are um, uh, the categories where there are where there's no data in the homomorphisms. They either exist or they don't. But there's uh, uh, but there's uh, no new information from knowing which morphism took you from A to B. Um, okay. Yeah, so you know. Five is less than or equal to seven in only one way. <laughs>